welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time we're going to take a look at this, the Raspberry Pi Pico W microcontroller. This was released at the end of June 2022, and in this video we're going to be using the board with a BME280 sensor to make a wireless weather station. So let's go and get started. So, here we have the new Raspberry Pi Pico W, and I'll also bring in an original Pico for comparison. There we are. And both of these boards are based on Raspberry Pi's own RP2040 microcontroller chip, which has a dual-core ARM Cortex-M0 Plus processor that can be clocked up to 133 MHz, as well as 264 kilobytes of RAM. Both boards also have two megabytes of onboard flash storage, a micro USB 1.1 connector that can be used to power the board and for programming the flash, and they also have 40 pads for GPIO connectivity, where on the original Pico we've already got some headers connected to this board, which is why it's slightly taller. However, as the name suggests, the Raspberry Pi Pico W also has a wireless module. And this contains an Infian CYW43439 chip that offers 2.4 GHz 802.11n Wi-Fi 4, as well as Bluetooth 5.2. Adding this extra component has inevitably increased the price, with the Pico W costing $6 compared to $4 for the original Pico. Raspberry Pi have also launched a Pico H with pre-soldered headers that sells for $5, as well as a Pico WH for $7, which, as I'm sure you'd guess, has both pre-soldered headers and the wireless module. So there we are. We now have a Raspberry Pi Pico with onboard Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So let's now get this board up and running. A Raspberry Pi Pico can be programmed in many different languages, including C++, MicroPython, and even BASIC, as I illustrated in my last Pi Pico video. However, here we're going to be using MicroPython, which we need to install on the board. To do this, we need to download an appropriate USB flashing format, or UF2, file, and we can get this from the Raspberry Pi website, where the documentation for the Pico is absolutely fantastic. Anyway, what we want right now is the UF2 files. So if we scroll down here, we'll find we've got MicroPython UF2 files for both the original Pico here, and also for the Pico W, which is the one we're going to download. And if I click on this file to download it, you'll see in fact I've downloaded it already, and when I did so I noticed that the file name here includes the word unstable, which made me slightly nervous. So what I did after that was to go across to uh, the MicroPython website where you can also get a hold of the same file for the Pico W. Scroll down here and we can see all the different nightly builds. And all of these files, if we look at the bottom of the screen here, they're all labeled as unstable. And I searched around a bit and found this post on the Raspberry Pi website in the forums. And this talks about this issue. And there's a very helpful contribution here which explains that until we get version 1.2 of the MicroPython, the file is going to be labelled as unstable because it's a nightly build. So there's nothing wrong with the file we have downloaded. Anyway, that's all sorted out. We've now got the file available. It's sitting here on a folder on my desktop. And we need to get this across to the Pico W. And when I purchased my Pico W, I also bought this kit of goodies to go with it. So let's uh, open up this tin and we find inside we've got an appropriate cable as well as some headers which we'll be using later in the video. But for now, we need to take the cable and plug this uh, micro USB connector into the Pico like that. And then we need to hold down the boot select switch like this and to take the other end of the cable, there it is, and to plug this into our computer. And as we can see, it's been recognized down here. Let's uh, open up another window like that. And we'll open up the uh, Pico. And we can now take the uh, UF2 file over there, copy the file, and uh, paste it across to the Pico like uh, this. There we go. It'll go across. Very exciting. Always fun to be using USB 1.1 connection. 
And there we are, it has finished. And now the drive will disappear because the Pico has been programmed with that file. And what we now need to do is to open up a program which we can use to access the Pico. And the program we're going to use is going to be Sony, which you can obtain from uh, the Sony website over here, sony.org. It's available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. But here we're in Windows, where I've already installed and run up Sony over here. And if we look at the bottom right corner, we see it currently says Python 3.79. But if we click down here, we can now select the Raspberry Pi Pico because it is plugged in. There we are. And oh, look, we're now working on the Raspberry Pi Pico. Let's give ourselves a bit more space down there. And if we want to, we can test things are working. We can execute a Python command, which of course will have to be print hello like that, because what else would we do? And uh, there we are, we printed hello, everything seems to be working. And so what I'm now going to do is to close this down to disconnect the Pico and return to the hardware side of our project. Right, in addition to the Pico W, we're going to use a Bosch BME 280 sensor to read temperature, pressure and humidity. This particular board with a BME 280 sensor on it is from Pi Moroni. It costs uh, £13.80. And if we flick it over, we can see the BME 280. It's a tiny little thing down here. This said, although I'm using this particular board, there are lots of different versions of this available. For example, there's one from Adafruit for $14.95. And if we wanted to, we could just connect four wires directly from this board to the Pico to make a very, very compact unit. But I expect to use this Raspberry Pi Pico W in lots of different projects. And so what I'm going to do is to solder on these headers to allow the Pico to be mounted on a breadboard. So let's get on with that molten metal operation. Here we go. And with a wisp or two of drifting flux, our Pico W has gained two headers and can now be inserted into a little breadboard. Next, we need to wire things up with two jumper cables connecting the BME 280 to 3.3 volt power and the ground rail. There are then two further cables linking the sensor's serial clock line or SCL and serial data line or SDA to GP1 and GP0 respectively. In order to communicate with the sensor, we're going to configure this pair of pins to provide access to one of the Pico's two I2C interfaces. And talking of which, it's now time to delve into the wonderful world of code. Greetings. Here I am back again in Thony, connected to the Pico, where I've written a small program, as you can see. And I'm going to save this on the Pico by going to a file and to a save. And we're going to save onto the Pico itself. And we're going to call it main dot pi because main dot pi is the name you give a file if you want it to auto run on the pico and in a second we'll take a look at this code i'll show you what it does but before we do that before we can execute this code before we can use it we need to install the library for the bme 280 sensor on the pico and to do that we'll go to tools and manage packages here in thony and we'll type bme 280 and search for it over here and uh, there we are, the library we want is the one down here, MicroPython BME 280. We'll uh, click on that and we will install. There we are, going across the Pico, all done. So now let's take a look at the code which will in part use that library. And as you can see, it starts out by importing some modules. It imports pin and uh, I squared C so we can use those in the code. It imports sleep and it imports BME 280. And then we initialize I squared C, as you can see, using the pins I talked about earlier, GP0 and GP1, and we set a frequency for communication. And then after that, we have an infinite loop, while true will always be true, where, as you can see, we read from the sensor, and we read from it three variables, temperature, pressure, and humidity, by taking BME.values 0, 1, and 2, which give us temperature, pressure, and humidity. And then I put all of these values together in a string, which has got some labels. So it's got temperature, then the temperature variable, humidity, humidity, etc. If we scroll across, it finishes off with pressure, as you can see. 
And then if we come back down here, we then print out reading and then wait for 10 seconds and the loop continues. And I would note I could have done this in a more efficient manner. I didn't have to define three variables and add them down here. I could have put the uh, BME values parts here directly into this uh, definition of a uh, reading, but I thought it was easier to see what was going on by defining the values first. And the reason I put everything into one string will become clear in the next segment of the video. Anyway, for now, let's see if this works. So we'll go to a run like that and a run the current script. And uh, it looks like it works. There we are. Let's just uh, get some more space on the screen. We can see that it's given us one reading, as we can see. And once 10 seconds has gone by, there we are. We have a second reading, which is uh, almost exactly the same. And this will continue. But wouldn't it be even better if rather than putting the data here on the console with the Pico connected to the PC, if the data was instead transmitted by the Pico over Wi-Fi so we could access it in a web browser? And guess what? That's what we're now going to do. Right, here I am back with some revised code. And just before I go through it, I want to make a couple of points. Firstly, I want to make it clear I can't possibly cover everything in this code in detail in the rest of this video, because there's a lot of big concepts involved in getting the PyPico W connected to a Wi-Fi network and serving an HTML page. And linked to that, I want to make it clear that my code here draws heavily on code from the Raspberry Pi Foundation, particularly code they develop in this tutorial here, very good tutorial about connecting your Pi Pico W to a wireless network and interacting with it. And of course, I'll give you a link to this in the video description. But this said, we'll come back to the code here and say a few things. It does start as last time by importing modules here, including network and socket. And then it defines SSID and password, the details required to connect to a Wi-Fi network, which of course will be unique to a particular network. And then it initializes I squared C as previously. This bit of code should probably be lower down here, but it'll work there, so I'll leave it where it is. We then define various functions. First of all, a function to connect to the wireless network. This has got little loop in it as it tries to connect. We know that connecting to a Wi-Fi network is never instantaneous, so it keeps on trying until it's connected and then returns the IP address it's been given. There's then another function for opening a socket using that IP address, and then another function for a web page. And this function takes a value, which is reading, which you might remember is the string we set up in the last piece of code to amalgamate the readings from the sensor. And what this basically does is to have a basic piece of HTML here, which defines document type, opens HTML, has a head as you can see, with in particular this critical piece of code in to force the page to refresh every 10 seconds. And then in the body of the HTML, we've just got one paragraph, which includes the content in our reading string. We then have further down an even bigger function defined. This goes through an infinite loop, and it basically reads the sensor as previously, and then serves the web page. And then finally, all this basically is just setting things up, defining things. At the bottom of the code, the PicoW is told to connect to the network and report its IP, to open a socket, and to serve the web page. So that's the theory, but I'm sure you want to know if it works. So we'll give ourselves a bit of space down in the console down there, and we will run this code like this. And there we are. And first of all, the Pico will try and connect to a network. There it says, waiting for connection. Go on, find a connection. It'll do it if we talk nicely to it. There we are. It's connected at 192.168.106. So if we go across to a web browser and we go to that IP address, 192.168.106, it's remembered it from previously in my tests. And there we are. It still amazes me, but it works. We're actually transmitting data wirelessly from the Pico, serving it as a web page, and picking it up on another computer on the network. And as we can see, every now and then it's updating. Every 10 seconds, we're getting revised measurements so we can stay fully up to date with temperature, humidity, and pressure. This said, right now we've got the Pico connected to our desktop PC, so that's not terribly exciting. So what I'm now going to do is to disconnect the Pico from the PC, connect it to a USB power bank, so it can boot up the main.py code totally independently. 
Guess what? I'm now outside. But don't worry, I've brought a computer with me, the Raspberry Pi Pico W, running from a USB power bank, as you can see. And I presume the board has booted up. I can't tell. I should have implemented an LED, really, shouldn't I? But uh, never mind, I didn't. So we'll assume it's running OK, and we'll go back inside. And here I am, reunited with the desktop PC. We don't have Thonny running this time, of course. No need for that. We can go straight to the web browser and put in the right address, 192.168. And it wants to be, oh, look, it's remembered it down there. And yes, it's working. I shouldn't be so surprised, should I? But there we are. We've got the Pi Pico outside all by itself, running on a battery and sending us temperature, humidity, and pressure readings. I'm pleased with that. That's a good result. I can't think of anything else to say, so it must now be time to bring this video to a close. The Pico W is a fantastic addition to the Raspberry Pi family and presents us with all kinds of opportunities for making our own IoT, our own Internet of Things devices. And I also plan on using the board in a future video to control a robot over Wi-Fi. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon.